This episode of Cecil or Something is brought to you by Full Sail University. Hello everyone, I'm just letting you know I'm taping this earlier last week because of the holiday, the Memorial Day holiday, which I hope you're all enjoying. And I, actually, I hope I'm enjoying it too. Let me know, Adam. And uh, so something may have happened in the news since then, so forgive me if I'm not addressing things that are happening in my future. Uh, okay, Microsoft press conference, Xbox One. Uh, clearly, you guys didn't like it. I don't think I've ever seen such a unanimous reaction, both on my Twitter feed and in the comments section of anything that could be commented on. Uh, it was talking about just how upset they were about the Xbox One. Primarily how it doesn't seem to be for them, it doesn't seem to be accounting for them. And then there's the used games aspect, not to say anything about the perception, be it right or wrong, of the always online aspect of it. Um, where I really think these problems seem to be coming from is, is, is a matter of messaging. And this is something that has tripped up Sony, it has tripped up Nintendo, it's definitely tripped up Microsoft in this instance, but it's also an issue that you can see happening for a lot of other large corporations. Uh, you, know, you can see this at CES, you can see this at other trade shows. It's a kind of strange artifice where something you're being talked to in this dogmatic way and with these catchphrases and these, these smiles that you'll start to make you cringe because no one would ever actually speak to one individual person in that manner. And you start to wonder if you're even relevant to this conversation, as I think most of you did out there. It was incredibly bad messaging. It was their first announcement of the Xbox, and while I knew they weren't going to talk much about games, and they have every intention, as they told me, to go very games-heavy at E3, it's probably even best to look at this as a two-part E3 conference that started last week. It was the first announcement of the Xbox, and I don't know why it wouldn't have been thought that a large swath of core gamers would be in attendance and making a point of seeing what was coming out of the press conference, but they decided to steer the conversation in exactly the opposite direction. And so in the idea of message, what they're doing is telling a story, and they clearly told a story that a lot of people weren't compelled in. And you know, you see this story coming out of Nintendo about the magic of how the Wii U comes about, or Miyamoto's in his garden digging up Wiis, and bingo, we get Pikmin. It's just kind of a new common marketing message. And one thing I do feel I've been seeing is that on the gamer side, you know, in the forums, on the internet, uh, there's another narrative that's also being spun, and it's one that already had been existing, that something evil is coming up with Microsoft and the Xbox. Uh, you know, they're going to block you as games. It's not going to be backwards compatible. It's going to force you to go always online because of DRM. That story was already brewing, and these two different spun narratives, these controlled stories, suddenly converged in one instance, and that's what allowed this eruption of anger and frustration because it almost led up to what people's expectations were. And I think this dovetails with the other story, which is Sony really made all these horrible missteps in this current generation, and everyone likes that underdog story. Although I would caution everyone to think back. Uh, you know, it was February, and Sony had the benefit of not having to be as specific, but they made a lot of wonderful promises about magic and all the things that can happen in this console and showed us Killzone 4. So I, I, I think that everyone needs to sort of take a step back and look at it for what it is and try to separate that story, both the story they're telling and the story that we're already concocting in our heads of how this all is all going to play out and see what's laid bare. And what really is evident, and this is for Sony and for Microsoft, is a whole lot of nothing. Uh, they demonstrated some things that have to do with the TV application, it was specific there, but we just don't seem to know anything other than a great deal of confidence in both companies about their own product that they're going to try to sell you at the end of the year. And with that lack of really knowing anything, um, I think I'm just in the position where I'm going to wait and find out what these things really are. I, I, I made a comment on Twitter that some people got angry with and I had to retreat from a little bit, but I said that E3 will be the final judgment. Uh, actually, the final judgment will be in the purchasing or at least you know, getting the physical thing in your hand. I meant in this first step of the introduction of the new consoles out there. That is where there is a sense of obligation that they have to bring clarity, they have to bring product, there has to be something empirical that's suddenly put in front of us at E3 that we can check against the rather grandiose claims about what these wonder boxes can actually do. But until then, it's really just ephemera. And I gotta say, is sound and fury signify nothing. All right, guys, uh, before we get to the question, let's uh, do a little thing here for our sponsor, Full Sail University. You love to play video games, but have you thought about creating them? Whether you're interested in programming art and animation, story creation, or even producing games, there's a game degree program at Full Sail University to fit your needs. 
Full Sail grads have worked on titles such as Red Dead Redemption, the Call of Duty series, and more. If you're looking for an online program, Full Sail's Game Art and Game Design Bachelor's degree programs utilize Full Sail's immersive education platform, giving you the ability to earn your degree from anywhere in the world. Visit fullsail.edu slash Sessler to learn more. All right, question time. Uh, this comes from Holy Nub. It's a nub with a halo. Hey Adam, this past week, Nintendo announced their copyright claim on fan-generated online videos featuring their games, causing confusion and frustration in the Let's Play community. The LP community is ever-growing, and with the promotion of sharing content via Sony's PS4, the barrier for entry into LPing is progressively getting lower. What are your thoughts on Nintendo's statement? How do you think the industry should approach fan-generated content given the increasing number of LP videos? Okay, so the Let's Play videos. I have been aware of this growing of people playing games and watching people play other games, which I'll, I'll look, I'll, I'll just age myself on this one. I'm, I, 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 I greet it with, with some degree of bafflement, though I cannot deny its amazing success out there. Um, I can barely watch me playing a game. So uh, I, I would love for you guys actually in the comments to give me a sense of how you consume that type of media. If you really sit there and just watch the game as it's playing, do you have music in the background? Are you working on a paper or a treatise? Um, or if it really is that compelling for you. I'm not, I'm, I'm not disabusing you of, of doing that. It's just a point of fascination for me. Having said that, Nintendo, I don't know what they were thinking. Here you have this company that has this horrible PR relationship with a large swath of the gaming community, and clearly the people doing Let's Play videos of Nintendo games are demonstrating some fidelity to the Nintendo product, the last loyal people left, and here they go and they say, now nah, you, uh, if you're gonna do that, we're gonna make money off of that, and so we're gonna dissuade you from putting out there a demonstration of enthusiasm for our products. Um, it, it, is, it is yet another one of the mystifying and really concerning uh, behaviors on the part of Nintendo which just seemed both tone deaf and really mercurial. Uh, I, I just, I, I don't, it, I, it really just is reaffirming to me that there's a lot of confusion going on over there and that different people are trying to move the company in different directions and uh, it, it, it doesn't bode well. Uh, having said that, we all need to acknowledge something and this is you know, something that even us who work in video as video game journalists um, have to consider that is copyrighted material. They do have a legal claim over it and they did ostensibly nothing wrong, although it was incredibly bad PR. And it, it is interesting, the kind of cottage industries and economies that have sprung up out of video games with some very, very tolerant publishers out there about how other people can generate some degree of income off of what is their own property. But it is an act of trust. And there's not even a gentleman's handshake that allows us to believe that it will continue like this going further. And with what we're gonna see with the sharing videos and who's gonna be owning that pipeline and where these videos are gonna be uploaded, we could be moving into some very, very uncertain territory that could affect a lot of people, myself to say the least. All right, well that's it for this week. Uh, please uh, ask more questions, uh, put them down below. Also, keep your eye out for uh, the review of Fuse. This is the first multi-platform game ever from Insomniac. Uh, my, uh, I, I was a studio that makes Ratchet and Clank, one of my favorite franchises of all time. Also, if you somehow have missed everything Xbox One oriented, there are more than enough videos. And I will say, I think very, very good ones that might give you some uh, enlightenment as to the Fuhrer of the week.